Okay, we're back again to the third reading of Kwanzaa for Conrad, read by Odie Hawkins, author of Kwanzaa for Con Conrad and the Survival Tangle. The book can be purchased at Barnes & Noble and Amazon. And you can also purchase it at your local bookstore, just saying the name Odie Hawkins and the name of the book, Kwanzaa for Conrad. And again, uh, Odie Hawkins' website is www.odiehawkins.com. Mr. Hawkins, would you continue the third reading for Kwanzaa for Conrad? You! Step over here! Me? Yes, you! The lights had suddenly lit, lit up a scene that had only received firelight was blinding. I can't see! I felt hands grab, push me toward a police car. Was I being arrested? Okay, take the position and spread them. I took a careful look at the young Mexican woman in the LAPD uniform. Her large blonde male partner stood off to the side. Do what? You heard me? She literally growled. Do what? Spread what? I asked her, trying to sound macho. She grabbed my hand, slammed him onto the hood of a police car, what well, I would assume it was hers, and grabbed my legs and what would have to be considered an improper manner. Spread them, she insisted. Spread what? What should I spread? She solved the problem by placing her right brogan between my legs and giving each one of my feet a brutal kick, forcing my legs to an unreasonable distance from each other. I felt totally vulnerable. So that's what spread them meant. Her hands went all over my body, into my pockets, Heavy hands, intrusive hands. I felt violated. She handed my wallet to her partner. Officer, shut your mouth. Turn around and don't speak until I ask you to speak. Now that really rankled. Who in the hell could silence the press? Officer, my name is Michael Bronstein. I'm a reporter for City Beat Magazine. Shut up. Officer Mendoza, never will forget her. I can see her little black plastic name plate in my worst nightmares. I took a careful assessment of the situation and decided not to risk a physical assault by further antagonizing Officer Mendoza. Her partner was already warming up by pounding my wallet into his left palm. Where in the hell was Emmanuel Conrad? Weird scene in the vacant lot lecture place. The police had taken control without the slightest inkling of what had happened there, or what Mr. Philpott had spoken about was speaking about. They were simply into group dispersal. They were screening us out, those who had been too slow to check out before they corralled us. Officer Mendoza looked like an angry pit bull. Roll up your sleeves. Roll up my sleeves? What are you, some kind of comedian or something? I said roll up your sleeves, or do you want me to roll them up for you? I rolled up my sleeves immediately. She and her partner they held my arms out and inspected each one with their flashlights. What the hell are they doing? The blonde guy, couldn't see his nameplate, turned my arm over like it was a wet pretzel. Where do you fix? It, it's harder to hear when you're nervous. I found that out on this particular occasion. I work, I, I work for City Beat Magazine. That's not what I asked you, clown. Where do you shoot your shit? Oh my God, they're accusing me of being a dope fiend. I'll be in the newspapers. My family will die of shame. I felt like crying. Uh, I don't shoot anything, officer. Blondie seemed to have some sort of fixation on drugs. What's your drug of choice? Crack, crank, weed, coke? I glanced around a the lot. There were six or seven police cars and policemen interrogating guys who look like me. What the hell is going on here? Racial profiling? Did you hear what he asked you? Officer Mendoza snarled at me. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> I do two drugs. I don't even smoke cigarettes. Maybe it was the man that softened her up, or maybe it was time for a shift change. I can't say, but suddenly there was a shift of attitude. You got a press card here that says you're a reporter for City Beat Magazine. 
The blonde was carefully studying the contents of my wallet. Yes, yes, I'm a reporter. That's what I've been trying to tell you guys. He handed my wallet back. Officer Mendoza looked like she wanted to slap my face, at least. What are you doing down here? There was so much contempt and disgust in her voice, I felt like saying something extremely sarcastic, but I thought better of it. I'm writing a story. The two fascists exchanged nasty, coded smiles. Blondie handed my wallet back, and they hopped back into their squad car and drove off. I stood in place for a couple of minutes, outraged by the way I had been treated. No apology, no reasonable calls, no courteous treatment. I could feel a scathing red boiling article bubbling up in my brain. The nerve of these, these, these pigs. I walked out of the lot past the few stragglers who were still being harassed by the police. The cops looked at me but didn't prevent me from leaving the scene. Guess they had already checked out my confrontation with Officer, Officer Mendoza and Blondie. Conrad came up behind me like a shadow the minute I walked across the street. He strolled beside me for a few steps before either one of us spoke. Hey man, what happened to you? I looked around and you were gone. Conrad seemed a bit surprised to hear me sound so rude. I was steamed. Well, Mike, let me put it to you this way. You know the words of that old country and western song? You gotta know when to hold and when to fold. It was time to fold. Maybe that's true, but you could have told me that it was time to fold. Look, man, I don't have any kids named Michael Braunstein. You're a grown-ass man. And if you don't have enough sense to know when to fold, then that's your problem. I thought about the logic of his statement as we turned into Fifth and San Julian. I had to admit he had a point, but I couldn't argue it. Come on, Mike. Let me buy you a cup of joe. I gotta warn you, it ain't Starbucks quality latte or shit like that, but it's black and strong. He flashed his charming smile, and I was hooked. This dude had charisma. Two cups of the worst coffee I've ever had in my entire life in one of the most fascinating atmospheres I've ever been in. Emmanuel Conrad was a celebrity in his community, a strange kind of celebrity, but celebrated nevertheless. People came up to him and shook his hand, or their hands were shaking when they shook his. His standard closed palm handout was one dollar. Why such a large amount, Conrad? I asked him, trying to be sarcastic. He ignored my sophomore sarcasm. I'm trying to spread it around. I'd rather give a lot of people a little than give a few people a lot. And what the hell are you talking about? You ain't gave nobody shit. We laughed a lot talking about the police encounter. We were watching you, Bronstein. We were watching you from across the street and the shadows over there. We saw you. I felt a little puffed up. Had I acquitted myself well? Did I punk out? Well, how do you think it went? I mean, do you think I did okay? Conrad clamped a big hand-sized right hand on my left shoulder, looked me straight in the eye and spoke softly with great emphasis on each word. Brunstein, you did an absolutely fantastic job of ass-kissing, just the way any one of us would have done it. I would have to give you an A-plus for the way you handle the situation. It probably saved your ass. I didn't know whether to be pleased or depressed. Had I ass kicked? Well, yeah, I guess so. After all, uh, Officer Mendoza wasn't one of those mad dogs you stood up to if you valued your balls. Instinct told me that. The restaurant we were in, if one used that term loosely, was an ancient, smudgy-looking cave of a room that had probably never seen better days. A waitress in bib coveralls and a painter's cap walked around splashing coffee into cups that were half empty. Once again, the surreal thing seemed real to me. 
Uh oh. Conrad almost moaned in my ear. Here come Dr. B. I had about nine seconds to relate to the phenomenon he was describing before she occupied our table and the surrounding area. She pounced on us without superfluous preliminaries. Honestly, I started knowing who I was and what I had to do in order to do what I had to do. I like to think that I was a strong-willed individual with an insatiable desire to be independent, to do my own thing. Astounding lady, absolutely astounding. She took our table by direct attack. Even Conrad seemed subdued, seated across from her. Her monologue was direct and aimed at each of us. She made me think that I knew her, or that I would benefit from knowing her. But look, I don't want it to be known as one of those people who are always giving excessive praise to some ancient ancestor. Don't misunderstand me. I don't think anything wrong with that. <coughs> it's just that I like to think I'm the person responsible for being the person I am, okay? I'm not suggesting that I haven't had help along the way, but I want to make it quite clear that I did it my way, did? We nodded submissively. The woman was a tsunami. She wasn't excessively loud. There were several other people talking much louder than she was, but they lacked the force of her intensity, the drive of her flow. So, Emmanuel, how's the book going? She suddenly blindsided him with a question. I was amused to see Mr. Emmanuel Conrad blink in the headlights for a few beats. She was the first person I had heard ask him about his book. This book, the first person I had heard call him Emmanuel. Uh, the book is going well. Uh, going well. Uh, that's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. I think it's a good book. Perhaps an important book. I think it should be read by the masses. She paused and stared into my face as though she were reading a road map. I felt compelled to react to the reading with a reading of my own. I didn't know where else to go. About 50 maybe, but once again I had to remind myself that people aged fast out here. A small woman with cocoa colored skin and light gray eyes who looked bigger, taller because of her aggressive attitude. Her light gray eyes had the zealot's bloodshot look. Without taking her eyes off of me, she dug down into a pinstripe ditty bag and pulled out a pipe bottle of cheap wine, poured the dregs of the coffee cup in front of her onto the floor and filled it to the brim from her wine bottle. I couldn't help but notice Conrad's eyes wall up to the ceiling and back to ground level. Oh. She must have swallowed the whole cup of wine before refilling it. So, how you were going, Dr. D.B.? A very coy, almost shy look enveloped her expressive face. Well, what kind of a reply do you, do you want? The standard? You know it's going well. It's not going well. You know it's uh, whatever. Conrad answered with a shrug of, of his massive shoulders. He seemed to have recovered some what from his former damned, I'm overwhelmed state. An hour later, sprawled on a piece of flattened car, a clean Kleenex box, a half yard away from the section of pavement Emmanuel Conrad had once spent three years attached to, I stared up at a troubled urban sky. I had no idea that downtown L.A. was so busy after dark, after closing time. Sleeping on a piece of cardboard on the sidewalk was Conrad's idea, a way to wake me up. Conrad, I gotta ask you. Why are we out here? His voice was a blend of all the stuff we were living in. That's not a very good question, Michael. I'm out here, as you said, because in my mind, I'm in my world, my element, as you would say it, in City V Magazine. Why are you out here? This guy was doing major work on my inner skull. What the hell was I doing out here? Sleeping on the streets. Well, let's say I'm doing research for my story. It'll be more authentic if I live it. You know what I'm saying? Well, that doesn't explain why you're out here. You got a place in the Ghetto Sketchers Hotel. I saw it. 
His reply took so long I thought he had gone to sleep. The sound of his voice was strangely solemn. Michael, what you have to understand is that old habits are hard to break, even out here. I feel at one with this. I would like to say that I drifted off into an easy sleep because I was dog-ass tired, but it didn't happen. I kept thinking back to the story of this woman who had been stomped to death a few yards away from where we were days ago. The gruesome image of someone being stomped to death caused me to react to the heavy sounds that vibrated through the concrete a block away. I didn't sleep well on the streets that night. Dawn. I woke up thinking about what my parents would have thought about where I was. I looked over at Conrad, his hands laced behind his head, staring up at the skyscrapers clustered around us. You know, this is a first for me. He didn't change his position, unlace his palms behind his head, or even acknowledge my presence, but he answered me with a question. First time you've ever slept out of doors? First time I've ever slept out of doors on the sidewalk. I've gone on a lots of camping trips. If a smile could ever be labeled sarcastic, I saw it on Conrad's face. He didn't say anything. He simply smiled. My deadline was met. My interview with Mr. Emanuel Conrad, Skid Row novelist, black spiritual cousin of Bukowski, was met. Shirley Brown, editor, bitch of City Beat, was really pleased, but just a wee bit miffed by my reluctance to front it with Officer Mendoza and Blondie. Come on, Mike, you've had years of Tai Chi. You could have taken both of them. Think about the story. And they would have shot me with their little guns. Oh, well, glad we didn't use you because you were trying to be macho. Never liked the editors. Who always gave, always gave me the vibe that they were failed writers who knew how to cancel out serious emotions. Shirley Brown acquired that status big time in her editing of Emmanuel Conrad, Ghetto Artist. Surely, the guy is a writer. He's not an artist. Not only that, if I may be so bold, he's not a ghetto artist. He's a world-class writer. Have you read Oshima, Fuentes, Singer, Miller, Tadizaki, Soyenka, Wright, Baldwin, Kansanzakis? Emmanuel Conrad is in that category. Get out of here. What are you talking about? I'm serious. Have you read St. Julian Street? Three days later, Shirley emailed me. Open pages for you. Finish the Kwanzaa piece. Kwanzaa? What Kwanzaa? What the hell was this control freak PMS suspect talking about? I emailed back. Kwanzaa piece? She replied, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Proceed or accept replacement now. I understood clearly. Either do additional coverage or step aside to allow baby blue eyes to go down and trample over all the ground you've cultivated. We'll proceed, I emailed, and packed a small backpack of essentials. I knew where to go to hook up with Conrad. That took me off the hook, so I thought. I hadn't realized what a gypsy he was. Oh, Conrad, I know, baby. Look, can you give Mama a little spell change? Up north where? I think he went to Pebble Al uh, Pebble, Pebble Alto. Pebble, Pebble Alto? That's what I said. The weasel woman who had previously wheedled twenties out of me suddenly became a downtrodden informant. I think he went to the Pebble Alto VA for a, a, a prostration examination. I slid, I slid a 
fire spot in her hair and took careful note of her surprised expression. <coughs> I don't know, baby. <coughs> no, could you? <coughs> could you? <coughs> Uncharacteristically, I dismissed her would-be solicitation with a snide expression. Been here, done this. Nothing to do with hang out. Skid row shit took place immediately or never, or maybe tomorrow. I decided to hang out. Two weeks later, after I had become addicted to crack, Conrad got up on me. I'm going to postpone reading number four. Oh my goodness. Until tomorrow. Oh. Bear with me. You mean that newspaper guy got addicted to crack? Uh, we'll have to find out, won't we? I think that's what he said, but we have to be cautious because, oh. well, as they say, shit happens. Same time, possibly. Same time. Tomorrow or right. at an earlier time. <laughs> or maybe at a later time. Maybe at a later time. But let's see what happens. All right. Good night for now. <laughs>